But, oh, there is a lot of interest in new ways of doing philanthropy today, uh, more, being more strategic. And, and as we've heard, you know, there's a new wave of donors, of entrepreneurial donors, who are bringing their business skills to what they're doing, um, and who are seeking to make lasting um, impact on social change. But my own observation, and this comes from looking at hundreds of uh, reports from, on family giving and so on, is that um, uh, philanthropy is, is still well embedded in personal and family choices and driven by very personal values around giving something back to the community. So I think my first point is that in promoting philanthropy we have to be aware of its very strategic as well as personal orientations. Um, so what I'm going to cover is a, a sort of helicopter view of financial trends, family engagement, uh, how much we do think things are changing and is it generational, and then I want to just take a quick sort of quick look into our key don some of our key donor constituencies, which are women, local givers, and some diversity in giving. Um, so it'll just be a, a snap, little snapshot and, and making a few points in each of those areas. Um, I've been uh, looking at trends in giving through family foundations for the last seven years, funded by the Paris Foundation, which is a family foundation. And um, they asked me to do this. They knew I did a lot of work around the statistics of giving uh, because they wanted to get a better understanding of um, how much wealthy people were contributing today. And was that going up as um, wealth was, the wealth of the wealthiest group was going up or what was happening? And, and give it a bit more profile. Um, using the foundation, foundation statistics is the best measure we have because both here and in the UK there is no data on major giving, so it's very, very hard to get a handle on it. But a lot of giving goes through um, uh, foundations or donor advised funds and gets reflected in community foundation figures and so on. So we've, we focus a bit on foundations as a way of getting a measure, but we are talking about family philanthropy more broadly because talking about the foundation, you're talking about gifts that people make. Um, so peers were, um, were very keen to profile what was happening and I think we have given the whole idea of family philanthropy, particularly through foundations, a, a much higher profile than it had before. It has a very high profile in the US and family philanthropy has been the fastest growing area of philanthropy in the US. So first of all, a quick look at how much private giving actually contributes and my estimate drawn from a number of different sources. Again, we have to use different surveys to look at different bits of giving because there's no general survey. My estimate is that private giving in the UK is worth around 19 billion, which is a very big figure. If you include everything uh, from legacies to, um, to the tax that gets paid back to charities, it's 19 billion. And family foundations represent a chunky 7.4% of that. And I, having done the books now over a period of time, ah, <laughs> it was just the air con. <laughs> <laughs> having done the, done the books over a period of time now, I can look back over a decade, and my estimate is that giving through the family, top family foundations, I've looked at 150 in fact, has grown by 39% uh, over that time in real terms, which is about 4% per annum. Very steady growth. So, um, and a lot of that is due to the laying down of these endowments, of, you know, sort of long, uh, longer um, commitments to giving. And I noticed that a lot of foundations were created in 2006-07 when the markets were at their highest point and people have topped up what they've, um, topped up these shell foundations as they've begun to retire and so on. And I, I mean, I do wonder whether this level of growth will be sustained as we go forward when we haven't seen such strong markets. So that I haven't researched that, but it's definitely one to watch. So I do think family foundation giving and family giving has grown over that time. And last year, for the first time, we, we looked at family, sort of active family engagement in the foundations. I don't think anybody had ever studied this before. And uh, we found to our absolute amazement that 73% of these foundations have got family trustees on their boards. Very often the founder 
has many living founders. Altogether, 180 family trustees across um, these foundations. And some of them, down this end, you can see there are foundations where you've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine family members on the board. Uh, the largest group are where there's just one or two. But what we're seeing here is a huge amount of family involvement. And that's why I think that in thinking about taking philanthropy forward, we have to think very hard about how does the family fit into the picture? And what is the impact of, of the family on the giving choices that are made and the decisions that are made? We can compare, uh, well, we can get a, a little insight from looking at um, the US studies of their own family foundation giving. And what we find is that, that two thirds of them have a focus on place-based giving, their local geography, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, because it's important for us too. But I thought two-thirds was a very high figure, and it just shows you how family giving is very rooted also in local communities and allegiances. Um, and surprisingly also, you can see that one-fifth of the newest foundations don't intend to be around in perpetuity, which is also interesting. It shows a lot of donor engagement in giving, maybe a distrust of who might take over your money. but. Um, also because I think there's some anxiety about this is the key place. Maybe some anxiety about what funds will be worth in the future and that might be changing as we you know, as the markets pick up again. There are a lot of seventy percent were created after nineteen nineties, again an indicator of how very active and strong family philanthropy is. Younger generations involved and they had they found two thirds had family donors still on the board. So also a very, very high family engagement. And I think that's a very strong point to promote when we're trying to promote philanthropy, that it is a family activity. But, you know, for donor advisors, it does mean that the family wishes have to be respected. And, and I know I've listened to some of um, donor advisors talking about models for giving, logic models, and how to be strategic and have impact. And then you think about, you know, wives and partners sailing in and saying, ah, but I want it all to go to the valley. And I know that's what happens. <laughs> because you see these huge gifts going to someone's you know, very, very personal cause. So looking around motivation, and again, thinking about you know, the importance of tradition as well as change. Um, here's uh, the, this, I think it's the nephew of Frank Bustle, who recently said uh, about, about the founder of the Bustle Foundation, Sadly, the issues that inspired Frank Buffle to act 80 years ago, children in need, are still confronted by the trust on a daily basis. I'm sure Frank would be proud of the trust's work today, but would be sorry, though not surprised, that services are still necessary. So a strong honouring of the founder there, and not in a negative way. I mean, sometimes people talk about the dead hand of the founder. But this is very live and real and immediate, and I think we shouldn't be negative about that. Um, Sir Jules Thorne, it was my grandfather's vision that founded this trust, but it's the commitment and expertise of its trustees that's carrying it on. I feel the trust has a heart and soul that came from its founder and the personality that reflects my mother. It's very, very, very real. Um, and, uh, and here is an example of a French American trust, actually, which is a family foundation, but doesn't want to, is honouring the family, but doesn't want to live on. And they said the foundation was created by our parents, and we wanted to honour them by giving away as much as possible while we were all still in relative agreement. I mean, also very interesting, because, of course, families can go very much the other way. And you do find families, like the Rising family, where, you know, in the end, the children set up their own separate trusts. The biggest Sainsbury foundations in the UK are all spending out their money. They don't want to be here in perpetuity. We know you'll know about the Atlantic Charitable Trust, of course, it's been mentioned several times today. But there are also small trusts like this Connie and Albert, uh, Connie and Albert Taylor Trust in the UK, which gives away about three million pounds. They don't want to be in, around in perpetuity and they've given the trustees quite a lot of discretion on how the money is used. Um, other values I've come across, and this is in you know, today's family foundation reports, but this is not a historical account. Uh, Angela Arons has just set up this new foundation. Um, she wants to help Christian organizations that help disadvantaged young people. Now, Angela Arons was the director of Burberry and did her giving to the Burberry Foundation, but now she's left Burberry and gone to Apple. 
um, and um, has set up her own foundation and the gifts are following her. Now I find out all of this from the Daily Mail. <laughs> and I think one of the really interesting things about studying major donors is, you know, you do get a lot from the Daily Mail, it's pretty so, and other, of its ilk. And I did think when I produced the Family Foundation Giving Report first, and I should call it something like Family Giving's Hello, because <laughs> talking about major donors, you, you can't get away from these personality factors. And I think that that's very important too when we're thinking about logic models and strategic giving, that a lot of these people have very different lifestyles. Duty and ethics, it seems old stuff, but it's still terribly important today. It's the right thing to do. So here's Zilla being me. I started to feel I was losing touch with who I was, and I wanted to contribute more. I feel very fortunate having been given many opportunities and felt giving back is the right thing to do. Professional and personal passions. Here's David Harding, wants to inspire a new generation to love maths through his gifts to the Science Museum, where he spent many happy hours pressing buttons in his youth, didn't we all? Well, I don't think I learned much from it. <laughs> Paul Marshall, hedge fund in the city. He's, he, has, he has put money into a new institute for philanthropy and social entrepreneurship at the London School of Economics to promote more entrepreneurial and strategic ways of giving, very much bringing his city culture into giving. And there are small, many smaller givers also who are interested in new and innovative ways of using their money other than grants to support what charities might do. But it is a very diverse patch and it's very important to recognize that um, there are degrees of family involvement in, in boards. And I think that um, the personal and diverse and family-oriented nature of philanthropy really presents a challenge <laughs> for governments who increasingly might like to see philanthropy as part of public policy. You could kill the goose that lays the golden eggs if you push that one too far. Now, I just want to briefly mention, I'm not going to go in detail, into a study that I did last year with City Philanthropy, which is supported by the City Bridge Trust to promote giving in the city. And they asked me if I would look at whether there was new attitudes amongst what they called the young millennial donors, the young city professionals. Um, and whether their attitudes were different and were they more strategically oriented. And what I found was that they don't call their giving philanthropy, this is, for, this is young people, and they call it charity. They feel um, their understanding is not very strong in identifying beneficiaries' needs and how they can really make an impact. That's where they feel weak, and of course, don't we all? Um, and what really matters to them is assessing what can be achieved with gifts and the effectiveness of their giving and assessing needs. So um, that's quite a strong culture around, you know, a very effective giving. And um, I miss that one. Um, we found in all the, in all the um, results of that study that there was a strong age-related trend and that young people's attitudes were different from older people's attitudes. Um, so getting more information was much more important to the youngest generation, which is the left-hand bar, 48%, than the oldest ones. And the older people were much more inclined to say, nothing would encourage me to give any more to charity. It's a bit more skeptical. All of this information is available in reports that are on the web, and you can get details from me about that if you want to follow any of this up. I want to say a little bit about older donors. Um, as you can see, these, these lines represent who has been giving the most, trends in who's been giving the most, and you can see that older women come out, I thought I'd choose a really glamorous one, so <laughs> women are right on top there, um, as emerging as a, 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 a big donor group. And um, also, um, in terms of legacies, it's very, very interesting that there's the research showing that um, women without children give, um, legacies that are 10 times higher than, than those who do have children. And now, in, in many ways, you can say, yes, that's natural, you know, who would expect anything different? But um, we may, that may be something we want to address with women. You know, we may, we may want them to think much more about charitable causes and what they're doing for the children's environment and not just, the, you know, their, their, their particular, the, the advantages that their own children have. Um,
I mean, women's giving is different from men. Um, for a start, they're often giving away the money that their partners have earned. And um, often giving takes place within joint household decisions. So um, you have to think about how, how do partners negotiate these decisions around major giving. And I gave you some examples there of, of James and Jules Oliver and Lord and Lady Bamford. Women giving away their husbands or partners' wealth. There's a lot of examples, Helen Hamlin, Teresa Sackler, Billy and Duffield. Some women are beginning to give in their own right. J.K. Rowling, Steve Shirley and Margaret Barber are all great examples of strong women who, who direct their own giving. Women can be unpredictable though, so we always have to be careful with, and I don't know how many of you, with generalizations, I don't know how many of you have come across Gina Miller, who um, set up the True and Fair Foundation. She was formerly Miller Philanthropy, and I have to say she was lauded widely in the giving community as a as new role model for women's giving, and she was asked to speak at a lot of women's forums in London. She was a women's, um, she was a women's representative. Now, last two, two, in 2013, she uh, published a report calling on the Charity Commission to cap, chari to cap mandatorily charity spending on running costs and administration. And she did use the numbers in a very crude way. She was heavily criticized by the sector and anyone who knew anything about the sector numbers. They criticized her before she published. They criticized her after she published. And now, I have to say, she's seen as a real traitor to the movement. <laughs> so don't take women for granted and don't feel they don't need to be worked on as well as male donors. I just, now I'm going to say a little bit about local and community giving. Community fundraising in itself raises about 100 million pounds for the big charities, and it's utterly vital to the small charities. That uh, is the cover of a little report I did funded by the Garfield Weston Foundation, and we looked at the funding of smaller local charities. And what this chart shows you is that some of these charities, which all of whom had an income of under three million pounds a year, so they were at the smaller end, some of them were under 50K, they had an average of six funding sources, six fundraising sources. So this shows you the huge amount of fundraising that's going on at the local level, and they're fundraising in different ways. So um, community fundraising and local gifts are terribly important to these small community charities. And I've put a quote in here, <laughs> I can't put in who said it, so I can't, I can't uh, remember who said, I believe giving time is important. Is it? Oh yes, this came from, this is one of the young people in the city survey. I believe giving time is important as it puts people in touch with their community. And it doesn't mean they're just throwing money at things. It makes communities more cohesive and socially aware. So I think we know local giving has many aspects to it. It's not just about giving the money. Localgiving.com is now attracting about £9 million pounds a year in foundations. And the community foundation movement across the UK um, has all collectively about 500 million pounds in its endowment. Now I know Jackie did give me a new figure for the Community Foundation of Ireland and I have, so it's 40 million. 40 million now, yes. Um, so local and community giving is terribly important and I've got some examples here of recent major local giving. And the first one is the Lempriere Pringle Charitable Trust, I'm running out of time here which made grants of over 20 million to Auckland Castle, which has a wonderful collection of paintings by this Spanish artist, Francisco Zubaran, and here's one of his absolutely <coughs> beautiful paintings of strawberries. And, um, but the point about that gift is, although it's about art, it's also about trying to lead the um, regeneration of Bishop, the Bishop Auckland area through building up a huge local asset, and that's the kind of thing that local giving can do. And here's a few other examples. The Ainscough Trust, two million for a youth centre in Wigan, which was the area where they live. Alliance Family Trust, a huge gift of 15 million pounds to the Manchester Business School, also to help economic development in the region. The Bamford Charitable Foundation, they fund those living within a 40 mile, 40 mile radius of Rosester. It must be quite difficult to work out who's in and who's out there. But that's where the JCB company, this huge global construction company, um, is based. Barber works in the northeast of England. Um, Peter Sowerby, he's, you know, they've placed a big emphasis on North Yorkshire, which is where he came from. 
and the Freshfield Foundation is one of the Peter Moores Trusts, and, and they supported a new swimming pool and leisure centre for Formby, and I don't know if you've been to Formby, but I mean, an asset like that is worth a huge amount. So this is just to show you how important local giving can be. Now, I don't want to go over time, so I'm going to, to just, um, I, I just want to mention before uh, stopping, that all of this also applies to migrant communities who are very generous donors. Our research showed that average giving amongst migrants was higher than, percentage giving was higher than the general UK population. They are, you know, there are major givers amongst the migrant communities who are just as colourful as, um, as our own major givers. It's, you know, but, but the giving is still rooted in faith, rooted in the family, and some of the most important um, figures like St uh, Stephanie Shirley, who's a UK philanthropy ambassador, was a child refugee herself, and that has motivated a lot of her giving. So I can say more about that. I've got stuff I've written about that, but I'll, I'll stop there.